Hello, everybody. This is Kimmy, and welcome to another episode of the Always Talking Crime podcast. This is episode 11. I'm super excited to tell you about this one. And as promised, I know I told you guys last week um, during the Catherine Knight episode that I know I've been doing some really, really gruesome and um, cringy episodes. So this one, um, while it's still, you know, um, kind of, you know, very upsetting, not kind of upsetting, it's very upsetting and there's going to be some trigger warnings for um, home invasion, trigger warning for rape, um, trigger warning for sexual abuse. Um, this is a survivor story. And I thought it was time for me to do a story with a survivor in it. So phew, no matter what you hear, just know that this awesome badass of a woman is going to survive. Now, before we get started with the story, I do want to let you know that we have a Patreon now. So you are listening to this on Sunday, May 1st, and I am recording this actually on Thursday. I think I mentioned it to you before that typically for the regular episodes, um, I try to record on Thursdays because it's my day off from my J-O-B and I typically have the house to myself um, and a lot more privacy. So that's when I like to do it. But you guys, you're going to have the option to get two extra episodes every single month on my Patreon. So if you want to become a patron, I'm going to put the information here in the in the notes on the podcast. So you can click on it. You can look at the different tiers. Um, there's three different tiers right now. I may add a fourth later on, which will include a free piece of merch and probably a discount on more merch. But I'm not there yet with the merch. So just so you know, that's coming. But for now, I wanted to do three tiers. The first tier will give you a shout out and it's going to let you get your Sunday episodes on Saturday. If you are impatient like me and you don't want to friggin' wait, you just want the episode ASAP, you can sign up for that one, okay? And it just basically, you know, gives a little bit of monetary support um, for the podcast. Um, I do want to upgrade some of my equipment, microphones, things like that, some of my editing equipment. Um, so your donations and your sponsoring and your... Um, you know, just your support in the Patreon will help me do that. It'll also help me because some sometimes um, if I watch certain documentaries or need to read books and stuff, like that sometimes costs money. So you can kind of help me offset the cost of, you know, some of my research, which I would really, really appreciate. And then the other two tiers, the, the middle tier gives you all that other stuff. Plus it's Plus, it's going to give you one extra episode every month that will be released on the 10th of the month at the latest. I may surprise you guys and have it ready before then, but no later than the 10th of the month. And it's always going to be like a full length, amazing episode. Um, the third tier is going to give you two episodes every month <clears throat> on or before the 10th and on or before the 25th of every single month. So um, hit me up if you have any questions on that. Um, I'm so super excited to be at the point where I can do this. So um, anybody who wants to join that and, and get extra stuff, um, there's more, there's going to be a lot more coming, but um, just baby steps. Because like I said, I'm still like a little brand new um baby podcast pretty much and this is only episode 11 but it's going really really well and it's going really really well because of all you guys so even if you're not interested in becoming a patron that's okay stay with me every Sunday keep listening keep sharing the episodes hit those follow buttons please um rate the podcast if you're able to on whatever platform you're listening to because like for real that makes all the difference in getting this podcast out there to the masses and um yeah so then you make Kimmy happy <laughs> so anyways guys shall we get started
All right, you beautiful people out there. This is the story about the survival of Jennifer Mori, and it is amazing. In the early morning hours of April 15th of 1995, Jennifer Mori returned to her apartment in Houston, Texas, after spending the night out with friends at a local ale house. After midnight, a little bit after midnight, a friend agreed to drive Jennifer back to her home, the Bayou Park Apartments on Memorial Drive. The 25-year-old lawyer lived alone in this apartment complex that boasted a wide range of security features, including an eight-foot-tall fence around the perimeter and an on-duty security guard on the property at all times. Jennifer finished getting ready for bed that night and she quickly fell asleep around 4 a.m. So girlfriend, she, she was out late and she stayed up for a while and just getting to bed around 4 a.m. I'm way too old for that. I used to live that life, but oh my word, cannot handle that anymore. If you can, good on you. <laughs> However, it wasn't long before Jennifer woke up to a horrifying reality. She was in a very, very sound sleep, and then suddenly, as she began coming out of it, she felt someone on top of her. Someone with their body weight was pressing down and holding Jennifer's body down. He then began grabbing at her underwear and tried to yank them off. The entire thing, the entire time this was happening, Jennifer was totally confused and like didn't have a clue what was happening. So she's just like me, like I'm like kind of slow to waking up, especially if I had been out, you know, drinking the night before and I'm groggy and kind of confused. And, but this is like absolutely horrifying for me. Like just so you guys know, a little side note, like one of my biggest fears is like being asleep in my bed and some motherfucker hiding underneath my bed and coming out once I'm asleep. Like it, that just creeps me the hell out. So like, this is terrifying. Even though we know this is a survivor story, this is still absolutely terrifying and, and perhaps triggering for some people that have, you know, gone through any kind of assault. So, um, you know, like I said, I already gave you the appropriate trigger warnings, but just know, you know, shit's coming. Okay. So she was totally confused and didn't know exactly what was happening at first. Struggling in the dark against this attacker, she suddenly had the terrifying realization of what was happening. As she reached her hands up, she could feel a knife being held against her throat. The clearest thought that went through Jennifer's brain and woke her up was when she realized that she was going to be raped. With her adrenaline pumping, Jennifer began to scream and fight and kick at her unknown assailant. Her fighting back against him enraged the man on top of her and he stabbed her on the right side of her face. It was a really hard blow and Jennifer felt a sudden explosion of blood she later described it feeling like a hot waterfall just pouring out everywhere at that moment she had believed that he had cut her eye out entirely i can't even imagine after jennifer was stabbed she found her resolve to fight for her life she felt like she had to get him off of her and had to stop this attack. She could not accept that she was going to be raped and possibly even killed. Jennifer continued to fight back and scream, but the man went for her throat next. I can't even believe that, like, <clears throat> she lives in an apartment building. I can't believe that neighbors didn't hear anything if she was screaming and fighting him off like there had to have been neighbors either next door above her or below her that would have fucking heard you know like i don't know about you guys if any of you have lived in an apartment building but i have i hate apartment living but when i did like i remember laying in bed at night and i could hear the guy in the apartment underneath me in his bedroom cough in 
that was kind of crazy because me and my, um, it was with my first husband, my first ex-husband. Um, we had just got done <laughs> having like really, really loud middle of the night sex. <laughs> and like, yeah, I was loud. Well, we were both loud, but it was crazy. And, and I was loud. And when we were done, we were laying there. And then that's when we heard the neighbor just kind of cough. It was kind of like a low cough, like he cleared his throat. <laughs> and then we just died laughing because then we realized how loud we were. And if we heard him like being so quiet, like, oh my gosh. So anyways, I got off a little tangent there. But anyways, I hate apartment living. So I can't believe that nobody fucking heard Jennifer screaming and like they could have called the cops, you know. <clears throat> but anyways, Jennifer hadn't thought about what the next step could be. Not until her throat had been slit open. It was at that moment that she knew and she thought for sure that she was going to die. And she didn't want to die. She just wanted to get out of there and would have done anything to live at that particular moment. I love this girl. As Jennifer bled profusely from both her neck and her face... Her attacker dragged her across the room and into the bathroom. He left her there and went back to the bedroom for his knife. Somehow she, I don't know how, but somehow she remained conscious despite the fact that she had like heavy blood loss. And um, it's, it's good that she was thinking fast because like the blood, like he had just like nicked her jugular and like when he slit her throat and like so she, there was a lot of blood anyways jennifer's bathroom didn't have a lock on the door and she knew she wasn't strong enough to keep the door closed while standing so girlfriend used her head she's smart i mean she is a lawyer after all but she decided to sink to the floor. She sat on the floor, pressed her back against the bathroom door, and she put her feet up against the bathtub so that she could use all the strength she had in her legs to keep the door shut. She pushed and held as hard as she could. And during those moments, suddenly everything in the apartment became very quiet. Jennifer could still hear the man in her apartment he was walking around and he was moving items. Um, Jennifer grabbed a roll of toilet paper and she held it against her neck to, um, you know, help stop some of the bleeding or to absorb the blood as she waited to see what this assailant was going to do next. That would be just so fucking terrifying. That was when she heard the sound of his pants zipping up fucking asshole like what a fucking disgusting person Ugh. and jennifer just kept in waiting inside the bathroom like quietly pressing the door closed with her back all this time bleeding super profusely after some time jennifer could not hear the assailant in her apartment anymore that was the time that she knew she needed to make a choice. She knew she had to get out of there because if she stayed in there cowering, scared of what's on the other side of the door, she was for sure going to bleed to death. That'd be super, super scary because, yeah, it's true. Like, you can't just stay in the bathroom and bleed to death. Like, that's a for sure, like, thing of, you know, you being murdered. But if you take the chance and you know leave the room if you think he's gone i mean he could just be in there like hiding quietly you know ready to attack again like trying to trick her but if she doesn't take that chance she doesn't have any chance for survival so jennifer decided to open the bathroom door but her hands were like so slick and so slippery with blood that she couldn't get a good grip on the door handle then she realized the door was jammed shut and it was jammed shut because she had been pressing so hard on it with her back and her legs were pressed up against the bathtub that she, she pushed so hard that the, the door was like completely like just jammed shut. 
Then she had another one of those thoughts. And it was kind of like a sarcastic thought that you like think to yourself. It kind of went, I've survived the attack, but now I'm going to bleed to death in here because I can't open the bathroom door. With enough persistence, Jennifer managed finally to get the door open and she crawled out of the bathroom. She tried turning on the lights, but none of the lights worked. So the man had apparently cut the power to her apartment. Then she went to her landline phone and he had cut that line as well. So her phone wasn't working. There was no lights. That would be fucking terrifying. But fortunately, Jennifer had a cell phone in her apartment, which was a pretty uncommon item to have back in 1995. I'm like thinking to myself, in 1995, um, that's when like people had more of like the cell phone that was in a bag that was in your car and um, not that many people had like other phones at that time, but that's when they were first starting to come out, like the little flip phone and everything. <laughs> but anyways, Jennifer found her cell phone and she dialed 911 immediately. And this is what transpired. Jennifer said, please help me. This guy just tried to cut my throat. And the dispatcher said, ma'am, Jennifer said, there's blood everywhere. I'm covered in blood. He knew my name. I don't know who it was. I know I locked the door. I don't know how he got into the apartment. The dispatcher said, okay, ma'am, try and calm down a little bit. Jennifer said, why would anybody do something like this? The dispatcher said, I don't know. We have some crazy people in this world, but I want you to stay on the line. Jennifer said, what's your name? The dispatcher said, my name is Richard. And Jennifer said, I'm sorry, I'm calming down. The dispatcher said, there you go, you're doing fine. Right now, you're doing fine. At some point during this call, which was around 10 minutes in length, Jennifer tells her 911 dispatcher, Richard Everett, that someone was knocking at her door. She believed it was the Houston Police Department, but the dispatcher told her that law enforcement is not there yet. Jennifer shouted through the door and asked who, who was there. The person replies that it's Brian Gibson, an employee from Pinkerton Security. He states to her that he saw the attacker jump from her second floor balcony and attempted to pursue him. They had fought for a short while before the attacker fled across a field. The dispatcher, Everett, lets Jennifer know that neither the paramedics nor the police have contacted the building security yet, so she definitely should not open the door. So the dispatcher said, don't open the door right now. And Jennifer, calling through the locked apartment door, says, hello? And then she says to the dispatcher, they say it's security. And the dispatcher says, it's security? And Jennifer says, what's your name? And then the dispatcher says, do you see out the peephole? So Jennifer tells Everett, the dispatcher, that the man at her door is offering to help her. And here, like, remember, like, she is bleeding from her eye. Like, she can't see. And I had heard... Um, I had heard somewhere, I think I listened to this case on another podcast, and they mentioned that she wore glasses and contact lenses, so of course she didn't have this on her at the time, and I wear contact lenses, and without my contact lenses or my glasses, I am blind as a friggin' bat, like I cannot see anything, so I'm assuming it was the same with her, so even if you look through a peephole, you're not going to be able to see shit, it's just going to be like a big old blur, you know, that's it. Plus, she's bleeding from one eye. Plus, like, from her throat. So, I mean, she's, like, desperate. And, you know, I don't blame her. You know, she's, she's wanting somebody to help her now. You know, not 10 minutes from now. So, Brian Gibson um, continues to bang on the door, shouting that he wants to make sure she's okay and that she should let him in. And eventually, he stops because the police arrive to find him on the scene with a bloody right hand. Brian tells the police the same story he told Jennifer, you know, about how, you know, he saw, he, he saw the person like jumping out of her, um, 
second floor balcony and he, you know, was fighting with him and like attempted to pursue him when he ran off. Um, the police look at the dew covered grass and they didn't see any footprints. You know, you'd think that there would be kind of a trail of, you know, two people, you know, fighting and then somebody running off, but they didn't see anything at that time. A few minutes later, Jennifer heard many voices in the hallway and Everett, the dispatcher, confirmed that Houston police and fire were there. As soon as she opened the apartment door, she totally collapsed. She was taken to the hospital and she miraculously survived the attempt on her life. Although Jennifer's throat was slashed, her assailant had just nicked the jugular vein. So had he like gotten it like, had he hit it deeper or like it was like millimeters, like had he gone even just millimeters deeper or closer, um, it would have been a whole different ball game. This girl probably wouldn't have survived because the bleeding would have been so much um, more profuse and like faster. Like she probably wouldn't have been able to, you know, do all the things she did to save her life. The stab wound on her, the right side of her face grazed the corner of her eye, but ultimately missed it. So she did not lose her eye, thankfully. In the apartment, Jennifer's blood was splattered all over on the walls and even on the ceiling. After Jennifer was taken to the hospital, Houston police entered her apartment and they found a pair of men's underwear, a belt, a glove, a Pinkerton security guard hat, as well as the knife. All of the items were both covered in Jennifer and Brian Gibson's blood. After searching Brian, they see that he is missing his Pinkerton hat, he's missing his boxers, and he had even shaved his pubic hairs in an effort to leave less evidence at the crime scene. Like, this guy is fucking disgusting. Disgusting. Ugh. They assumed he had returned to retrieve his forgotten items and maybe even finish off killing Jennifer. Brian Wayne Gibson was 26 years old. He had started working for Pinkerton Security in 1992 at $5.25 an hour, which was a dollar more than minimum wage was at that time. During his three-year employment at Pinkerton, he had been removed. This pisses me off. He had been removed from two separate assignments for getting into arguments with his clients. His final reassignment was after one of the clients complained at a construction site. Brian had used the client's vehicle without permission. Instead of firing him or pressing charges, Pinkerton transferred him to night shift at Bayou Park where many young women lived alone including Jennifer Morey. <sighs> Between 1991, guys, and 1995, 130 Pinkerton guards were convicted of felonies in the state of Texas alone. The Pinkertons have a long and often bloody history in the United States dating all the way back to 1850. The agency still exists today, and it recently made headlines in 2020 after a Pinkerton security guard shot and killed a man during a Patriot rally in Denver, Colorado. Brian Wayne Gibson was convicted of attempted murder and he was sentenced to 20 years in prison. But Jennifer Morey's recovery from the attack was far from over. While she recovered in the hospital, she was visited by many of the police, the detectives, and the emergency responders who came to her rescue. They told her, girl, you put up one hell of a fight. And she sure did. Like, she, like I said earlier, she's a damn badass for sure. Jennifer returned to her apartment only to retrieve her belongings and move out. 
Though she was a lawyer, Jennifer hopped around from job to job, taking positions at temp agencies that she was, you know, jobs, doing jobs that she was well overqualified for. But like, you can only imagine like her state of mind and like her anxiety and her panic after just like going through all of the things that she had gone through. So like she, she was not in the frame of mind to just continue on with her you know, regular life. I'm, I'm sure that it took her a while as this is the case with many survivors of violent crimes. The trauma, you know, continues to resurface. But as far as Jennifer is concerned, um, with enough time, she did begin to rebuild her life. Jennifer actually filed a lawsuit against Pinkerton Security, and in 1998, she was awarded an undisclosed amount of money from the agency. That same year, she opened her own family practice in Fort Worth, Texas, and she met the man who would become her husband. Long after the attack and that harrowing 911 call, Jennifer Morey and her dispatcher, Richard Everett, are still good friends. Having instinct, intuition, and a big heart, Richard saved my life, Jennifer said. And for that, he will always be one of the most important people that has ever impacted my life. And I was lucky enough that when I got married, he even came to my wedding. Today, Jennifer M. Caldwell, Caldwell, Jennifer M. Caldwell is an accomplished family law attorney in Fort Worth, Texas. I love that. I even heard too that this was the dispatcher's very first night on the job. I don't remember where I read that. I ended up not putting in my notes, but I remember seeing it. So um, I'm going to be listing all of my case sources here. So if you you know are interested in looking over any more of the information, um, you'll probably see that too. But how amazing! Because like being a dispatcher and remaining so calm like that, like he did one hell of a job. Um, and if this was his first night as a dispatcher, like. You know, that is so, it's so commendable anyways, but um, gosh, I can't even imagine like having to go through that the first night on your new job, you know? And so kudos to both of them. I'm glad that they, you know, are friends. I'm glad that they're close. Um, it's just super cool. Um, one, another interesting thing I want to say about Pinkerton Security is I was actually listening to the latest episodes of um, the Morbid podcast where the girls there just had a two-part, um, like, two-part podcast episode about, I think her name was Dorothy Arnold and how she disappeared. And on the second part of it, they were going on and on about how when this particular woman, it was like back in like the 1920s or so, she had disappeared. Nobody knew who she, where she was, but it, can't come to find out is her family before she had even disappeared had hired Pinkerton security to um, do like private investigative stuff on their daughter while she would like they she was still living with them but they were so afraid that she was going to run off and get married or elope that you know they had some pi on her case at the time and she never ever even knew it and then later on she ended up disappearing and pinkerton security you know the the private investigators could not find her either so um i just thought that that was really interesting because i already knew i was doing this case i've already been researching Pinkerton security a little bit and so when that came up when I was listening to it yesterday I just thought that was pretty cool so they are definitely not um, a good company so guys I know this episode was a bit shorter than my episodes usually are but um, I wanted to let you know that the Patreon episode is going to be crazy and next week's episode is going to be crazy <laughs> we're going to be talking about mothers um for most of the month i don't think um i'm going to hit on it the entire month but um yeah 
that's pretty much going to be, um, you know, the, the subject, obviously, because Mother's Day is in May, and um, we're going to talk about a lot of mothers who have killed and even some mothers who have been killed. Um, I, I, it's it's, it's going to be a crazy month. <laughs> so, um, yeah, guys, um, what I have planned for you, you guys are not going to be able to believe. Like, I've been doing so much research and, like, honestly, like, a few of these cases have like kept me up at night. The first Patreon episode that is going to be out, you know, by May 10th at the latest, probably sooner. Um, but that episode is going to be so gruesome. Like I lost sleep for many nights in a row while I was um, researching this one because I just couldn't, I couldn't get the case off my mind. It's still in my mind, but like I would literally not be able to fall asleep and then I would wake up many, many times in the middle of the night and like think of it and then struggle to fall back asleep. It's just so heartbreaking. Um, So I am so obsessed with true crime and then it's just sometimes we have these cases that, you know, just hit us super hard like that. And I still find forensics like super interesting I like to um I really really am interested in what makes people tick and like I want to be like really careful while doing this podcast not to come across like I'm ever like celebrating you know the the killer or the serial killer or the murderer or whoever the villain is Whoever is committing the crime, they fucking suck. So I want to make that crystal clear. But sometimes I think that we as podcasters or people doing documentaries, they they talk a lot about the criminal because it's very interesting to try to figure out what fucking made them that way. What made them the type of person that would do these terrible, horrific, gruesome, morbid, ugh, just fucking downright disgusting things to other people. So, you know, whenever possible, I'm always going to try to talk more about the victims. Um, But, you know, I just wanted to make that clear. Like, I'm never, like, thinking these serial killers are cool people at all. But, you know, all of the details behind the scenes, like, you know, it just, it's really, really interesting to think about. So, Anyways, guys, um, there's a lot of things happening right now, um, currently in the true crime world. Um, who's the one chick that was found in the duffel bag? I can't think of her name off the top of my head. Is she Russian or she was like a mom of three and she was cheating on her husband? I can't think of her name off the top of my head right now, but I know you're probably screaming at me, <laughs> telling me who, who I'm supposed to be, you know, saying. So, um, good for you. If you like can remember her name, I know it's like a name that every time I go to say it out loud, I'm always like, mm, how do I say that? But her body was found in that duffel bag and it ended up being the guy arrested for it. The guy being held for it, um, is a guy that she was having an affair with and they had apparently gotten into a fight. Um, she was like calling off the relationship and he snapped and apparently murdered her and stuffed her body into a duffel bag. Um, just absolutely disgusting. So yeah, we'll have to keep our eyes out on that as, you know, the court proceedings go. Um, that's probably going to be a future podcast episode, I think. I do want to tell you guys real quickly because it made me think of this case here in Pensacola, Florida. I think I've mentioned before that to you guys that that's where I live. And I know there's a lot of you around this area here in the Gulf Coast that listen to this podcast. So, hey. Um, But when I moved to Pensacola in 2009, it was because um, my ex-husband, my son's dad, was in the Navy and we had been stationed here. He was actually the kennel master at the Navy base. So we moved here in June of 2009 and later that summer, I believe it was, a woman's body had been dismembered 
and put into a duffel bag and then tossed into the water, um, which was just outside, you know, the Navy base, Naval Air Station. That's, I think is what it's called. Um, Pensacola NAS. Anyways, our home was not far from that. So this is what happened. Here's like a little mini story, a little add on. There was a guy, um, uh, he was married. Um, he was in the Navy. Um, he didn't have any children yet, but he was married and he was fucking around with this other girl, this other woman who was younger. I think, I think he was only in his like early to mid twenties. And, um, I want to say he was like 24 or 25 and the girl he was fucking around with was a little bit younger, maybe like 19 or 20. She had one child at home, um, but she had gotten pregnant. And I want to say that his wife hadn't moved to Pensacola yet, but I could be wrong. So I'm not going to mention any names or anything because this is just off the top of my head because <laughs> I thought of it and um, I can't think of any of the names. But if any of you are interested, you can message me on either Instagram, like in the DMs, or shoot me an email if you want to know what the person's name is. My email address is always talking crime podcast at Gmail. Um, if you email me and ask me, I can tell you exactly what case it was, who the victim was, what her name was and everything. In fact, you know what? Hang on. I'm going to look it up real quick. Okay. Okay, guys, I found it. Thanks for letting me check this out. So the victim's name was Samira Watkins and she was murdered by the guy that she was having a relationship with. He was a Navy sailor named Zachary Littleton. So Zachary Littleton was 26. And Samira, um, she was actually 25. So she wasn't as young as I thought. Um, she had a four-year-old little boy. She was a manager at a local McDonald's. And she was two months pregnant. Now, like I thought I remembered... Um, Zachary Littleton's the fucking murderer his wife did not live in Pensacola yet she was also in the Navy and just hadn't moved here yet but they were making plans for her to also move to Pensacola to be with her husband um, so basically Littleton could no longer juggle his affair um, with Samira and Samira was two months pregnant and she refused to get an abortion. So he ultimately um, broke it off with her and um, she, you know, was still refusing to get an abortion. So he had made several phone calls to her and he ended up luring Samira to his home under the guise of wanting to work things out with her and discuss the pregnancy. But when she arrived, he fucking strangled her until she was unconscious. And that's, it takes a long time to fucking strangle somebody. Like my ex tried strangling me and it was fucking terrifying. So, I mean, and he was strangling me for like a good two minutes. It, I heard it takes like four or five minutes to actually like make somebody unconscious and like kill them. But anyways, when she was unconscious, he put tape on her mouth and then he stuffed her inside a duffel bag. After that, he drove to the Bayou Grand River and he dumped her body from the bridge. He later dumped her car in another area before calling a taxi to pick him up at the Waffle House. Um, so yeah, so th it's just disgusting. He ended up getting, um, let me see. He was convicted of first degree murder, sentenced to life in prison on November 3rd of 2009. She was actually reported missing by her family on October 29th of 2009. So I moved to Pensacola in June. This happened like around Halloween, like right before Halloween. So I mean, I wonder how her little boy and the rest of her family is doing. I mean, I hope, I hope that, um, oh my gosh, I hope that he's doing okay and they are all doing okay. There is, I'm noticing here online, there is a, um, on the ID channel, the true crime files by investigation, by investigation discovery, 
um, there is a episode about this case. It's called The Girl with the Gold Earring. And it looks like it's on YouTube. So I am probably going to put that in my case notes to my source file. So, you know, just know you got like a little extra mini, um, a little mini thing. But yeah, um, fuck that guy. Um, let's see what else it says about anything about the military, like taking, hopefully, hopefully he got like nothing from um the military after that hopefully he was like oh yeah okay so let's see if the navy found out about samira's pregnancy he was afraid that it could end his military career adultery is a crime in the military and punishable by the uniform code of military justice which is true so anyways um i'm sure he was booted out of the navy um and all that kind of stuff too so what a fucking asshole but anyways the girl with the gold earring um on investigation discovery and it says forbidden dying for love season two episode eight but i'm gonna put it i'm gonna put it in the case source files so if you guys if anybody's interested in watching that it looks like um, one of her family members is crying in the beginning of the video. So I'm sure it's going to be heartbreaking. And, you know, just keep that family in your prayers as well right now. Because, um, you know, with it being Mother's Day around the corner, you know, that that little boy now, you know, for the, that was how long ago? He's, you know, a teenager right now. So he's in high school. So I hope he's, I hope he's doing well. I hope the whole family is doing well and i hope that they've had a chance to heal i mean you know you they're always going to like miss samira but um she by the pictures of her she was absolutely beautiful so anyways guys with that i'm going to end this episode as always thank you thank you thank you you know i love you and i appreciate all of your support each and every one of you um can't wait to tell you about the next episode the next crazy bitch i'm going to be talking about oh guys it's going to be it's going to be i i know i keep using the word crazy but, but let's say insane this time insane can't wait to tell it to you see you next week until then keep talking crime